Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. On this episode of the podcast, we first bring you a roundtable conversation on the NBA and China. On October 4, Daryl Morey, who's the manager of the Houston Rockets, posted a tweet that included the words, quote, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong, unquote. China, of course, was not happy with Maury's tweet and severed several partnerships they had with the Rockets. Since then, the situation has snowballed, leading Maury to delete his tweet and apologize for it. And even NBA Commissioner Adam Silver has since issued a statement saying that the NBA would not regulate the speech of its players while also trying to appease China. So what is the current state of the NBA's relationship with China? And does the NBA have a moral responsibility to denounce China? Micah Watson, who is the professor of political science at Calvin University, joins Acton staff to discuss. Afterwards, Robert Dorr, who's the president and mortgage scholar at AEI, comes onto the show to talk about what works and what doesn't when trying to help people climb out of poverty. And he also shares a bit of his personal story to show how he came to be deeply interested in finding solutions to poverty. To learn more about the topics in this episode, I've linked some extra reading materials in the show notes, and those are posted every Wednesday when our episodes release at blog.actin.org. Also, if you like this episode, don't forget to leave us a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. I am joined today by Micah Watson, Professor of Political Science at Kelvin University, and Jordan Baller, Senior Research Fellow and Director of Publishing at the Acton Institute. Today, we will be discussing the controversy swirling around the National Basketball Association, the People's Republic of China, and the protest movement in Hong Kong. Uh, We've discussed the protest movement in Hong Kong back in June on this very podcast, and I'd encourage you to give that podcast a listen. This particular story begins with a tweet of an image by the Houston Rockets general manager, Daryl Morey, expressing solidarity with that protest movement. The tweet elicited a rebuke from NBA owners, from the Chinese consulate in Houston, the Chinese Basketball Association, and the NBA's corporate Chinese sponsors. From there... The story's kind of spiraled in a bunch of different directions, all of which we're going to discuss today. Uh, Gentlemen, we've got a lot to talk about. Jordan, where would you like to begin? Yeah, some of which we might discuss today. I don't know if we'll get to all of it. Um, And it is an evolving story. This is one of the interesting things about it. Over the the past few days, there have been a lot of developments. Um, One of the things I think it's exposing is the extent to which um, these global corporations – uh, and international relations are affected by by international trade and e- economic interests. So we've seen it on maybe a little smaller scales. We can talk about some of the other dynamics and precedents for it. Um, there have been investment in movie, you know, productions and things like that from from companies like Chinese companies like Tencent. And so I think uh, one of the stories was that a flag got removed from Maverick's jacket and Top Gun, right, which may or may not be so noticeable. Uh, the the ancient one in Doctor Strange was changed for the Chinese audience, the mainland China audience, and, and those sorts of things, which are not as high profile as somebody um, as famous as LeBron James going to China and you know being faced with questions about potentially faced with questions about his thoughts on the Hong Kong movement and so on. So this is really brought to light. It's been a kind of a flashpoint for. Um, something that has been simmering under the surface for a long time. Yeah, I, I guess one of the places we could start, um, Micah, the, the original tweet was very, very innocuous. It was just fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. It was actually just an image uh, with that. Um, and there was response from both Houston Rockets ownership, Chinese sponsors, the Chinese consulate. When this story was first emerging, what were your thoughts? Well, I was I was a bit taken aback. Um, I think the is it the co-owner of the, the New Jersey Nets um, also put up something on his on his Facebook yes. site about how in, in China there are what he called third rail issues. Um, Taiwan would be one. Tibet would be another. That links to the Marvel uh, character in Doctor Strange. And it was a, a bit surprising to see just how hard they came down on the Chinese side, and then how quickly the NBA fell in line. And as I was doing a little bit of, you know, Googling about this, I had not realized that two years ago, 
the Chinese government effectively outlawed Winnie the Pooh in China because some people had made, started making memes about the likeness between uh, their premiere and, and Winnie the Pooh. And so now Winnie the Pooh is out, uh, something that the South Park guys made a, a lot of hay of in their, in their latest episode. So, yeah, I, as this is um, – there's the, the level of surprise, at least for me, with how the Chinese government – has reacted and how sensitive they are. Uh, and then it's just snowballed with the quick reactions from the NBA. And then if we were you know, talking about other business, Blizzard, the gaming company, um, and Jordan mentioned the economics, which I think is huge. I mean, there's a reason why this is a big economic issue, but the cultural issue too, because we've had big companies uh, making accommodations, to put it diplomatically, for the Chinese interests for a long time. But somehow basketball feels quintessentially American and cultural in a way that adds on to that economic interest uh, in a way that has, I think, made this a flashpoint in a way that the other companies may not have been uh, as much. Yeah. The, uh, Joseph Tsai, the, uh, the Brooklyn Nets' new owner, is actually a major shareholder in Al- Alibaba, the big Chinese e-commerce firm. Um, so it wasn't surprising to me <laughs> that, right. that, he would, that he would step out like that. But the NBA's response kind of came in two stages. There was the first, the, the, the disavowal, the, the, the statement that Maury's tweet, tweet was not representative of the NBA and an apology to Chinese fans. Um, incidentally, there was a, a Chinese translation that was much more harshly worded that came out targeting Maury. So there were, there were sort of two initial NBA statements, one for an American audience and one for a Chinese audience. And then later, and this is when the advertisers began retaliating and, and China itself did, Nate Silver, the NBA commissioner, came back and said that we – that as a league, they weren't going to censor the political speech of any American on, or, or any of their uh, – any of their players or coaches or anything like that. Um, and that is what started a lot of those – a lot of those Chinese actions – Jordan, what have what have some of those actions been, and and how have they sort of uh, worked themselves out? Well, the league may not have to do anything. It's going to leave that to the teams, right? I mean, this is one of the the interesting things about it. Is it the league putting pressure on uh, the general manager of the Rockets, or it is the ownership of the Rockets? Is it the league putting pressure on, um, you know, the, the Philadelphia 76ers and the, these arenas that apparently are now censoring Americans on American soil? Who are bringing signs again from our from our context or perspective may look innocuous things that say things like Google Uyghurs so you can understand the plight of that that group within this you know within the context of China um, or Free Hong Kong which again in, in some level sounds innocuous to us but uh, within the regime in the context of, of China mainland China and its relationship to Hong Kong you know may not seem so innocuous. Um, so the fallout is that, that that's the other thing that's really interesting is is the extent to which this is. Um, cascaded into all kinds of areas and um, has resulted in actions that uh, I think many Americans, including myself, would not have predicted. I would I would have not have guessed that people would be getting their signs confiscated and or uh, you know people getting kicked out of arenas or something like that in the United States. Yeah, the anticipation one is interesting because that's the, there's a sort of pretty remarkable letter that was a bipartisan letter co-signed by um, AOC Alexandria Ocasio Cortez as well as. Uh, ben Sass and then Ted Cruz and then some other politicians. And anytime you get those three agreeing on something, it's going to be pretty noteworthy. And they made the point in writing to the NBA that you're a multi-billion dollar business or whatever it is, and you didn't have the sense to realize that doing business in China might precipitate some kind of crisis like this, at least be prepared for that. So you'd think at least they would have been prepared knowing that this sort of thing would come up, particularly given how the NBA prides itself on its players being socially conscious. They, and in some ways, the NFL got in a lot of trouble for the kneeling controversy. The NBA has gone the other way. We support our, uh, our players' right to speak out. Uh, they were very active in the North Carolina bathroom bill mm-hmm. thing. Right. Um, there was, uh, um, I forget who the, the pundit was who criticized LeBron James, but basically said, shut up and dribble, you know, and don't, and, and now. Yeah, well, Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram, right. yeah. And so now that we're in this different context, they have had to backtrack uh, very badly. Um, and this was supposed to be kind of a, a celebration, this brand new, not, not new and since they've been there for years, but this new stage of games and endorsements and what, 600 million or 800 million Chinese who love basketball and has completely backfired and, and should have been foreseeable um, given 
what they should have known about doing business in China. And and part of it is is there's there's a misunderstanding. A lot a lot of the narratives um, coming out. Some of the more cynical sports writers have said, you know, this is this is just capitalism, and this is how it works, and this is this has always only been about money. But when you have dozens of Chinese firms all pull out at the same time, pull sneaker endorsements for players, pull sponsorships for the games, for the state television network in China to pull the broadcast of NBA preseason games, and then you know another large network in China, the reality of it is, is these are all appendages of the communist regime. These are not independent businesses contracting with the NBA. This is something that... And the response from China has been coordinated in a way that you would never see if there were a controversy, um, let's say, with British firms sponsoring the NBA. You know, you would never see this sort of coordinated action um, and this insistence that people be fired, apologies be made. Um, the NBA has tried very, very hard to make those sort of apologies as far as it can go and be still politically acceptable to its American audience. And that is that is not sufficient, at least so far. Well, for me, one one of the really interesting dynamics uh, that's that's revealed in this whole uh, phenomenon is that, you know, there's there's a concern over the concentration of any kind of power. Certainly, right, um, and legitimate concerns about the centralization of economic power, the the amassing of economic power, and certainly large firms like these teams that are worth billions of dollars, or this league that does billions of dollars of interest. I mean, these are these are economically powerful actors. Um, often, the critics of capitalism emphasize the power of corporations, you know, um, and to some extent, that's 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 valid. But the dynamic that's revealed here is. Uh, you know these supposedly powerful corporations, um, you know, tremble before the, the coercive power of a state regime like like communist China. So um, it's that combination of both economic and political power, and the clear willingness to wield that power in uh, aggressive or punitive ways that really does belie this 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 balance of concern you could say between economic and political power. I mean, you know, the 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 strong hand of the of the communist state is is uh, clearly the um, the senior partner in this partnership. Right. For a long time, the hope has been that as China has embraced more free market reforms and its economy has been growing, that that will somehow seep in and the authoritarian nature of the regime will, will liberalize. Not unlike what happened in South Korea. Which, um, but what if it's the other way in this case? Yeah. What if actually then the the power of the market is able to be harnessed? by an authoritarian regime. You know, as, as you were saying um, earlier, one, one difference would be in the United States, if you had a number of companies make the stand that they have in China, you have some other company that would come up and take advantage of the other side, right, who would embrace the cause that has been left behind. We won't see that in China because it is so controlled in a free market, you would have some competition that would come along. Yeah, so Nike had a shoe that had a, a Betsy Ross flag or something on it, you know, and I thought, hey, Adidas should come out with a flag shoe, right. you know, yesterday right. to take advantage of that. And they could have if they had wanted to. I don't know if they did or not. But I mean, that's the reality of, the, of, a, of a more free market system where you don't have that kind of dynamic. No. Um, you know, Related to that, you often hear complaints about capitalism. It's irreformable. It is this this uh, uniform system, and we have to move beyond it in some ways. Well, I think you know the example you pointed to of, of certain kinds of free market reforms in China on the economic side illustrate the dynamism. You could say the adaptability the the, the of 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 capitalism, if that's what you want to call it, to various kinds of political regimes. It seems that. Perhaps communism is the is the phenomenon that's that's uh, irreformable, you know, and that it will it will make other things conform to it. Um, so again, maybe it's not the politics of China that's changing so much as the 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 economics of profit seeking are adapting itself to other political realities. There's um, in one of the places that this influence has been seen. Um is in the American sports media's coverage of this. There's been a lot of great American uh, journalism on this. But from the sports journalism community in general, there has been a sort of curious silence that's just starting to break up now. Um, there was a – Deadspin had reported 
that uh, at ESPN, uh, the uh, senior news director there had sent a memo uh, to the particularly the on-air talent mandating that any discussion of Daryl Morey's the Daryl Morey story avoid any political discussions of China and Hong Kong and focus on basketball issues. Now, right. A paraphrase of that might be just sh- shut up and talk about dribbling. Right. Which yeah. That CNN reporter got got silenced when she wanted to ask a question. Um, now, Jason Whitlock would be the exception. Yes. Jason Whitlock has been all over this and, and been quite vocal. This morning on, um, oh, what's the new Mike and Mike? Um, Trey and Mike. Trey and, and Mike. And Mike yeah, Trey, Trey Wingo yeah, said, he quoted, he quoted another figure, he said, you know, the real problem here was, you know, you need to have as a principle of life when you're in the media is do not press send. That the real problem was Daryl Morley's tweeting in the first place. And you saw that in their ESPN's <laughs> commentary this morning. That the real problem isn't the oppression of people in Hong Kong or the uh, concentration camps, right, in the, in the west of China um, or the organ harvesting or anything. The problem is that someone – Spoke about it. Right. And you should know better. Yeah. Why would you bring up something? And ESPN is owned by Disney, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, you can see how that chill works its way um, across the world, really, to affect what people will say uh, in front of a microphone. Absolutely. Um, speaking of people in front of microphones, uh, after the, the Warriors preseason game last night, um, Steve Kerr, President Trump, of course, inserted himself into this Always the helps. other day. Um, <laughs> he has long been critical of Steve Kerr and, and that it is not a mutual admiration society between, between right. them. Um, so Kerr responded in part to those criticisms but went on to make an argument for sort of the moral equivalency of the sort of injustice we've seen in the United States and the sort of injustice we see in communist China. Michael, what do you make of that sort of moral equivalency argument? You know, Steve Kerr's family personally suffered from terrorist acts. And so I, you know, I think he's an intelligent guy, smart guy, great basketball coach. Um, and But I, I'm surprised given his own experience with what happens with oppression and violence that he so easily made this equivalent. Now, gun violence is a real issue. The United States has real problems. That's that's a given. That's true. And, and sometimes we are too quick to pass over those. But to equate the problems that we have with the uh, the depth and the breadth of what's going on in China and what has gone on in China since Mao uh, is just gobsmackingly bad. Um, I, I don't have the vocabulary, or at least I shouldn't say it on on a podcast. I just find it. Um, Really irresponsible, and I think I think he's a guy. Yeah, if, he, if he sat and looked at those different figures and the numbers, that he would acknowledge. Yeah, right. We've got problems, but but I shouldn't be comparing the two as if they're somehow comparable. Just just bad. Well, bad and time. earlier in the press conference, to be fair to him, he he basically said that I don't know enough about it, and I'm not going to comment. Um, and I'm I feel comfortable commenting about things domestically at home in the United States, partly because that's the 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 freedoms that we have and enjoy, and I know more about it, right? But he didn't, unfortunately, in that in that snippet, stick to that. But and, what, and he what? went on to make this kind of claim that sounded like it was a kind of a moral equivalency, which is an example of a kind of whataboutism that you see more broadly in these kinds of discussions. So, um, you know, that's, an, that's just one more of these many tactics that there are to kind of move the focus away from what the real problems are with respect to human rights violations in China, the cause for independence and liberation in Hong Kong, um, and just, yeah, point to all kinds of other things that, well, we should be talking about this or that or the other thing, or I don't know anything about it. I'm more of an expert on, you know, gun violence in the United States, and that's what I prefer to focus on. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind, too, is the proximity of the anniversary, right? So this was, I think... Uh, within the last week or so, the 70th anniversary of the revolution. Um, it's also close to the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, there there are some reasons maybe that this, in addition to it being a really high profile thing by its very nature, being the NBA and the kind of stars that you have and the growth of uh, appreciation for basketball in China, there are some other kind of contexts which may explain the severity, the the the, the alacrity of the responses by, by, China, by China and Chinese institutions. Um, there's a good article, I think it just got posted today in the Washington Post by Isaac Stonefish that talks about um, some of these dynamics. And he makes the point that, uh, you know, China doesn't, it's not that it's a fragile regime that it's so worried necessarily about every, you know, little thing. It's it, uh, that it's going to be brought down by, you know, some of these, uh, these things that it, it cracks down on. But it, 
it does it because it can. It does it because it's a way of asserting the dominance in the relationship. Um, and it does so in varied ways. So it doesn't always tell you what you did wrong. You have to kind of intuit it and, and figure out psychologically as a league or as a team, well, how can we make this? And so that's why you see, I think, some of these overreactions, what I would consider overreactions, like now, now you've internalized the censorship protocol so much that you're, you're your ESPN and you're putting a map up of China that includes all these, you know, the map of the, the claim in the China South China Sea, sea which well, is a total ridiculous You're thing. banning Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I think it does seem like you're a little worried about things <laughs> well, maybe, if you're yeah. going to that extent of banning a, a cartoon. But And you've got, I mean, what's interesting about the the I don't know, this has been the standard line. Well, the first, the first NBA player to speak out about this was James Harden, who was asked before the NBA had sort of gotten its PR response down. And Harden basically apologized, talked about how much he loved China, how much they loved playing in China, uh, distanced himself from what his own general manager had said and supporting the protest movement in Hong Kong. And since the sort of common theme we've gotten of the very few NBA players or coaches who have said anything about this publicly is that they don't know enough to comment which seems to me disingenuous. Maybe if there were, you know, maybe maybe there'd be a few people in the NBA, but the fact that that every single person is saying this. Yeah, so the lack of the lack of I think Dan you were commenting about this earlier in our our, our conversations before the recording started the the lack of uh kind of off-the-cuff comments from players or executives or whatever, I mean, in social media and so on, that's telling in a way too, right? We haven't had hardly any <laughs> – there's been nothing. It's been radio silence. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between – I mean, you want to have respect for another culture and other people, and that certainly makes sense. Um, but in some ways, I'm reminded of, you know, uh, the campaign against apartheid South Africa. Right. And you would not have seen athletes – well, I don't know quite enough about this apartheid regime. See, maybe that's a – you know, he said, cultural she thing. said, yeah. cultural thing, yeah. you know, and and if you don't know anything about what China has been doing in some of these areas, well, then you probably shouldn't say anything at all until you learn more. And you might want to rethink about, you know, business relationships there that would be making, I mean, nothing wrong with making the money, but you want to know a little bit about the partners that are, that are paying you. Now, uh, turning this to sort of what sort of moral responsibility do... American businesses, this is because this is broader than the NBA. There are a lot of American businesses, a lot of individuals who do a lot of business with Chinese firms. What's what's their their moral responsibility when when doing business in this in the context of, you know, a communist regime? Well, you know, Micah just referred to uh, one historical antecedent that is the apartheid regime in South Africa. I think there are others, certainly the relationship with uh, the USSR during the Cold War is another interesting kind of historical analog that we could think about. Um, and, you know, this idea that's that because we're a, a free enterprise regime, that whoever we deal with is a free enterprise regime or that the, those kinds of um, standards are in place, I think, I mean, that's a fantasy. And so you have to be realistic about uh, the context that you're doing business in. And certainly you have to draw lines somewhere. I mean, there are certain accommodations I think that are reasonable to make given cultural diversity, given diversity of polities and different expectations and so on. But you do have examples of companies that have said, you know what, this far and no further. And when China expects us to do this, we're not going to do it and we're going to pull out or we're going to suffer the consequences. Like kicking so. out fans in your own stadiums for expressing Yeah, you would think speech. that would be – that might be, that line, might be yeah. beyond the pale. But <laughs> we'll see what kind of response the market back here in the United States has about that culturally and the – I mean what kind of price are these – these teams going to pay for that? Um, I'm I'm speaking for myself. I'm less excited about the NBA than I was two weeks ago. Um, you know, a company like Blizzard, uh, who is banning esports, uh, you know, ripping prizes away from winners of esports and banning them from competition, is facing its own kind of backlash. And so you can, I mean, the the, the examples of this kind of thing are numerous and. I think it'll be really interesting to see what kinds of backlash there is in an extended and and ongoing way against some of these firms, um, and whether that has any kind of impact on the calculus that these executives are making when they when they're deciding whether and how to do business in, in some of these really challenging environments. 
Micah, you're a professor of political science, so you do a little bit of this comparative analysis of these sorts of systems. Other than going in with their eyes open, as I think everybody now, that this, that this story has gone through the business cycle, if they weren't aware of how business is run in China and Chinese expectations of its foreign partners are, how do you think about those sort of economic relationships with, with very divergent political orders? Well, I, I should give a caveat that it's certainly not my wheelhouse in mm-hmm. China. But I, I, I agree with what Jordan said. I think um, business can be a force for good. Um, and I think that in a business exchange, you have things that they want and they have things that you want. If you have 800 million um, Chinese who are interested in the NBA, then the NBA actually has some cards to play here too. And I think you'd have to um, – you have to be honest with yourself in the beginning about where your, those lines are that you're not willing to, to cross, um, and both as an economic matter in terms of what will hurt or help our bottom line, and then as a moral matter, might there be a case in which, yeah, we'll hurt our bottom line because we're not going to be the kind of company that does this or partners with this sort of group. And I, I think at the very least, uh, um, a company needs to think about those sorts of questions beforehand. Um, and then I, I, you know, say here's how we'll operate given your culture in your culture, but really you can't be telling us how we police our own folks in our own society. Um, I think that strikes me as a just has to be a um, a given to start off with. Yeah, I'd like to close uh, with a quote uh, from Wilhelm Röpke, who was a German economist who wrote a lot on on East-West trade then in his own time, and this is reflecting on the Soviet Union. And I think this is a great, a great lesson for, for both American businessmen and, uh, and for supporters of the market. Um, quote, unless they are completely blinded by their short-term interests, Western businessmen should not find it so very difficult to see through Moscow's dishonest game. They should realize that this is another case of asymmetry in the market, one to be stressed especially by the market's friends. End quote. Micah Jordan, thank you so much for, uh, for discussing this. Thank you. Pleasure. It's no secret that getting a good education can change the direction of someone's life and in turn, the direction of society. But how should that education be delivered and who should determine where that education will happen? On October 22, at the North House in Minneapolis, the Acton Institute welcomes Lee McGrath, Senior Legislative Counsel at the Institute for Justice, to discuss. Join us at this upcoming Acton on Tap event to explore the current state of school choice and save your seat today at acton.org slash events. Welcome to Acton Line. I'm your host, John Caritas. Today, we're speaking with Robert Doerr, the president of the American Enterprise Institute since July 1 of this year, and a Morgrid scholar. His specialty, policy specialties are poverty, economic mobility, safety net programs, welfare reform. He has a long and distinguished history working in uh, state and local level on poverty programs and is uh, continuing that work today. He was here for the Acton Lecture Series. The title of Robert's uh, talk was Poverty in America. Welcome, Robert. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. You know, before we get into the actual particulars of your talk today, I wonder if you might be able to tell our listeners a little bit about your father. I was very moved by your by the part of your talk towards the end where you talked about what a great inspiration your father, John Doerr, was. So I thought for our listeners, it would be very um, interesting for you to talk about your father, what an inspiration he was, and the type of work he did sure, uh, during the sure. civil rights movement. So dad was a Midwestern Republican from northwest Wisconsin who, uh, when he was about 40, uh, was offered an opportunity to go work in the civil rights division of the United States Justice Department at the very end of the Eisenhower administration. And when he got there, uh, he discovered that you really couldn't do anything about civil rights enforcement or voting rights sitting behind a desk in Washington. So he went south and he started to deliver, to develop the facts and the investigations that led to some very important voting rights cases uh, that uh, ultimately over the period of the 1960s, he remained there after the Kennedys came to town in 1961 
and then served in the Justice Department through to the almost the end of the Johnson administration. And by that time, he was the head of the Justice Department, uh, Civil Rights Division. And so he had become um, a major player, not the only player, not the most important player, but an important, significant player in the efforts to find a way for our country to finally make true the promise of our constitution and our declaration of independence. And I think we did make great progress in securing voting rights and changing the South and changing our country. And dad played a role in that. And your father was instrumental in making sure that these voting rights, which were constitutional, actually were um, available to those who were um, given them as a right. Yeah. Well, he would go into towns and churches and he would make presentations to black members of the community and ask, is anyone here registered to vote? And no one would raise their hand. And when he found out why they hadn't registered, it was because if they did, they would be thrown off their land or they would not be able to get their cotton ginned or they would have other kinds of economic intimidation preventing them from being able to vote. And that kind of violation of their constitutional rights uh, was wrong. And he developed the facts that showed that if you uh, – if you, were, if you were white and could breathe, you could vote. But if you were black and you were a PhD in math, you were prevented from voting. So whatever tests they were putting in place in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia or Tennessee weren't fair. Um, and he, he really helped to, to lay the groundwork for the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, I should say that um, uh, the issues that he faced in voting rights – are a lot different than the questions concerning voting rights now in the United States, much, much different. And so those who say that whatever's happening with regard to things like requiring people to have a license is taking us back to those Jim Crow days, anybody that knows anything about those Jim Crow days knows that's not true at all. It's way over the top. Yeah. Yeah. So in recognition of your father's great work, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama. And shortly after his passing in 2012, Nicholas Lehman wrote a reminiscence in The New Yorker, and he he said this, um, John Doerr dared to go south to enforce these laws, but that was Doerr's job in the 1960s. He was, as Taylor Branch wrote, the Gary Cooper of the civil rights movement, tall, implacable, laconic. All true. Uh, He was tall. He was implacable. He was laconic. He had a sense of humor. And he, he was very good looking, um, uh, which I'm not, by the way. But uh, he was a hero, uh, a hero to his children and a hero to people that knew him and worked with him. And he also was terribly optimistic and patriotic about his country. And he believed that uh, we were made as Americans to tackle tough problems and to solve them and move forward. And, and he believed that and I still believe it. And you share that optimism as you told yeah. us today in your talk. Yeah. So let's get back into your talk, Poverty in America. You have a history of working for government agencies in New York, New yes, York State. Yes, I am. A, I confess, I am a former recovering government bureaucrat. Okay, uh, that's where I. That's where I. I was given an opportunity to serve, and I I took it. That gives you a little credibility, also, in terms of how these programs work. Uh, we might say. But I was intrigued by uh, how you explained what's working out there. And if I have this right, these government benefits that formerly were given out almost as an entitlement with no strings attached, welfare reform in the 90s changed that a lot. And it's been gradual, of course. And today we have a combination of work requirements, requirements. Benefits that um, are linked in some cases to work requirements, not always, but it's a blend more or less. We have we have a we have two big programs where work is really required. One is the temporary assistance for needy families program, or the old welfare program for single parents with children, and that's what Clinton changed, along with Speaker Gingrich and Republican governors and others to make a a work test or work requirement focused program. And that I think has been very successful in encouraging people who weren't working and who were definitely poor to go into work and have a much less uh, likely chance of being poor. And um, that's the program I worked on in New York City and New York State that led to dramatic declines in the number of recipients and big increases in work rates for 
never married and single mothers, and a reduction in child poverty. The other program that requires work is the Earned Income Tax Credit, which basically you can't get the benefit of that refundable tax credit unless you work. You have a job, right? Unless you have a job. So those two are very much work-focused. SNAP or food stamps, Medicaid or public health insurance, not so much. And housing, not so much. And my judgment is those programs that don't uh, inquire and provide aid and assistance to helping people get to what they really need, which is earnings, um, are letting those people down They're, by just being about, let me figure out how much you're eligible for and do the math here on my little piece of paper and then hand you your card, your benefit card or your eligibility card and say, I'll see you in a year when when that time goes up and come back and apply again and and then I'll see you again in another year. That's not really helping people move up or out of poverty. And so I think the purpose of my talk was to show when you have programs that are focused on helping people get out of poverty through employment, you're more likely to be successful in helping them get out of poverty than if you have programs that only help people by giving them a government benefit. And as you pointed out in your talk, uh, one of the key drivers today is this very strong economy that has done wonders for um, uh, reducing unemployment, giving people a shot at getting into this uh, economy. That's always true, and it's particularly true now. When the economy is strong and employers are reaching and stretching for workers and taking chances on people that they might have passed on in the past because they're so desperate for employees, raising wages, all of that is happening now in the American uh, labor force uh, all over the country. And uh, for people to not acknowledge that that's just a lot better circumstance to be in when you're trying to help people move up economically – is just silly. A strong economy really matters. And as a social services worker, I always was paying attention to policies that made life easier and better for employers because if they were happier and they were hiring, it was a lot easier for me to help people that were coming to my offices seeking aid. Right. So simple things like tax cuts, a way to spur the economy, less regulation, less regulation, employers have a higher level of confidence. They want to invest. You invest. You got to put people to work. All of that uh, is driving that. So, another thing you spent quite a bit of time on was family and the importance of keeping families intact. Starting out life, married before you have children, having a job, getting a good start. This is a little knottier of a problem that doesn't yield to just a new clever policy prescription. It, a lot of people are involved, a lot of sectors in this site are involved in promoting that. A- absolutely correct, and it is not here, but it is also very true that children raised in households with the benefit of two active and involved parents there for the long haul, and that usually happens inside marriage, do much better on average. Now, some single parents make great sacrifices and do very well, but it's just much harder. And to not acknowledge that, not recognize the importance of a father – and another parent there, especially in the early years, but really all through your childhood, is just to ignore the data. And so I wrote a report with very prominent left of center or Democratic or liberal scholars and very prominent right of center and Republican scholars, and we all agreed marriage matters. And um, sometimes people don't want to talk about that. They don't want to mention that. They think that's, well, that's a problem of one part of our society. It's really a problem of African Americans. That's not true. Uh, We have uh, single parent – children raised in single parent households is a problem of white families and Hispanic families and black families. We all have to face up to the fact that we need to be honest with young people that when they're making decisions about their future and they're thinking about having children, they need to think about how important it is for that child to have the benefit of a second parent there to love and to hold and to nurture and to educate and – um, something we really should know by common sense, but we lost that somehow and got to think that you know the second parent was unimportant or not necessary, and, and it's just not true. So AEI scholars have done really good work in this area. What other sectors of our society need to speak to this problem and affirm the, the power of of marriage in so many aspects. Who do we need well, to be hearing from? Well, education, education. I, I, when I was at the commissioner in New York State, I co-wrote a curriculum on the importance of fathers in children's lives that was put into the, uh, along with the 
the Secretary of Education, which we sent out to all of the public high schools in New York State, and asked them to include this in their, you know, in their life skills courses or their sex education courses. That you can talk about all sorts of things, but you can't talk about the importance of two parents. That's ridiculous. And so we wanted this to be in the schools. I happen to think faith-based organizations should talk about it more. I'm I happen to be a, a practicing Catholic, and I'm a a, a long supporter of the Catholic Church. But sometimes I go through year after year after year, and I don't remember my priest ever mentioning the importance of marriage and why marriage was important uh, before having children. And uh, uh, so I, I think we all need to talk about it more. Uh, m- movies in Hollywood. Sometimes, though, it's sort of funny. You'll be, walk, you'll be watching something on television, and there'll be something that celebrates you know, the role of fathers and, and parents, and, and you'll, you'll say, wow. They should do more of that. And, and, you know, all good stories, a lot of good stories are about how both parents helped raise a child successfully. It seems common sense, as you said. You mentioned civil society. We've written a lot here over the years at Acton about the importance of faith-based charities and other social services to help. How do you put that together with the clear need for government to play a role in a lot of these programs? How do those two collaborate effectively? Well, they're best when they collaborate and when they recognize the value of both. I happen to think that it is true that the growth of government has done some crowding out of faith-based organizations and sort of they've stepped in and said, we'll do this and we'll do it better. And I'm not so sure they do do it better. Um, But having said that, I don't think we could just walk away from the commitments government has made and leave it all up to the churches and, and civil society because I don't think they're equipped or ready to take it all on. So it's a partnership. I often am reminded of a f- famous story in New York when Cardinal O'Connor, who was one of the great New Yorkers and great leaders of the Catholic Church, was at a press conference with Mayor Koch, who was a previous mayor. I didn't work for Mayor Koch, but he was a previous mayor to the ones I did work for. And they were doing something together. They were great partners in all sorts of ways. And we did many things with Catholic Charities and the Archdiocese and providing aid to low-income New Yorkers. Um, and they were talking about some issue they were doing together, and they stopped talking about that, and then they said to the reporters, off-topic questions. And one of the reporters raised his hand and said, well, Cardinal, what are you going to do about this new regulation that just got passed by the city council, which apparently the mayor supports? Um, and, you know, you we can think about what that regulation was, but it was a regulation that was imposing a secular value or a value of the government upon faith-based organizations, which they couldn't live with. Classic conflict, right? And yeah. Cardinal O'Connor looked at the crowd and looked at the mayor and said, well, if that passes, we will no longer be able to serve the city in these various means. We won't be able to do all that we do for the city of New York's struggling population, whether it's in food assistance or child care or elderly services. And Mayor Koch looked up and said, whoa, well, then that means we can't pass that regulation because I can't help the people of the city of New York unless I have the cardinal and his people's support and aid. And so it's just not worth it to us. So my view is that government has to get out of the way and not not get out of the way completely, but not get in the way of faith-based organizations that are trying to do good work. Um, I also should say something that came up in the conversation we had Uh, just before this up in your organization. Um, I talk a lot about financial incentives and how benefit programs work and bureaucratic intricacies. Um, And government can do that. And when it does it, it can do it well. And when it does it badly, it does it badly. But, But it can make an effort at those sorts of things. But to talk to the spiritual side of an individual about motivation and faith and something greater than themselves. That's hard for government to do. And people who are struggling, people who are low income, people who are suffering from all kinds of difficulties, they need that too. And the only place they're going to get that is from a faith-based organization. And so uh, I tell a story about a guy who came home from prison and he had some bad breaks and he went back and then he came home again. And the second time he took advantage of some opportunities and he got himself together and he he got on his way. And, And someone asked him, well, what was the key the second time? Why did things go better the second time? And he said, when I realized that I had a role in my own future. And that only comes from uh, messaging and care that mentors and faith-based organizations can give to people. Government can give it too. Government should make it clear that um, 
It's a reciprocal responsibility. We will provide aid, but the person receiving aid has to do something too. But it's even better if everybody's sending that message. People have dignity. People have respect. People have potential. And um, we need uh, all of our institutions of civic life doing that. You know, we just wrapped up a a report on the opioid crisis and what private charities, nonprofits are doing to help these people. It is amazing the kind of help, the kind of uh, clarity to the way back they can get from these private groups, church-based, even sort of secularized 12-step groups are a big part of this. But it's not... They still need some assistance. It could be Medicare and other things, other government programs to help them get going. But what what these private and religious groups do is they address the spiritual core of the problem, and they can often provide some insight that, you know, government's not equipped to do. All true, and uh, they do do that. Although I would point out that sometimes uh, faith-based and religious organizations are the most um, strident in their rhetoric about government programs being only about giving out benefits. Agreed. And uh, that they'll challenge uh, my efforts to say that, uh, you know, I want to give out aid, but I also want to require certain personal responsibility on the part of the family or the individual. And sometimes faith-based organizations will put the word compassion above all else or, or interpret compassion to mean that you always just have to give. And you can never ask of somebody something. And I, I don't know about you, but the faith-based organizations I've been associated with have always recognized the role of the individual. Right. And these would be among those. And I, I want to be careful not to um, give a blanket endorsement for any group that says they belong to a church or affiliate with a church and all of a sudden that they're going to do wonderful work. Because as we know, it's a mixed bag too, just like government right. agencies, Right. Let's wrap up, if we could. You said towards the end of your talk, you're very optimistic about the future of the United States, especially in the civil rights area. What are the springs of that optimism? What are the things you see when you look around that tell Robert Doerr, hey, this is still a great country and we've got a lot of promise that we can can fulfill here? Well, there are two things. The first is I am a, a student of history and our country has been through great challenges in the past, the Depression, the Civil War, 1968, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, And we've always seems to have found a way to prevail, to struggle and prevail and move forward. And so I just feel in my heart that that we can do it again when we face difficulties. The second thing is is that um, I spend a lot of time traveling all through the country. And if you do that, you are reminded of the things that you don't see in the media or in the Hollywood or in the newspapers of just how strong and deep our country is, filled with people that are are going to work and doing great things and building businesses and starting organizations and, and volunteering. And we may get overwhelmed by the messages from the media, but we are a great country. We have been a great country and we're still going to be a great country. And so this – I'm not a great fan of this make America great again rhetoric because we were great before or take back America. I don't mm-hmm. like that either. Right. Neither one of those are right. We're – we're, so the this history tells me that we'll be fine and also just looking around. I mean and if you do any real comparison to most of the countries in the world, there are um, – There's a reason why, even now, if you ask people in countries around the world where they would rather live if they couldn't live in the country they live in now, they overwhelmingly choose the United States. We are a land of great opportunity. They're trying to kick the doors in, right? Yes. Let us in here. Let us in. So there's got to be something pretty darn good about what we promise. Robert, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you for listening today. If you want to learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, check out our website at acton.org. That's A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. If you want to reach our podcast team here at Acton and let us know what you think of the show, you can email us at actonline at acton.org. Last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen.